scientists tell us that there was a great valley called the Rift Valley. Mm. And that Rift Valley went, you know, from uh, uh, East Africa, uh, Kenya, and even below, all the way up right into Palestine. So it is from the Yemen um, that you find the pure form of the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone, my name is Mamoun Hassan. Welcome back to the Islamic Surah of Toronto YouTube channel. Today we're talking to Sheikh Abdullah Hakim quick about this beautiful new series that we're starting, which is a discussion about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam's life is one of the most documented lives Actually, it is the most documented life that you can ever imagine on the face of the earth. And it is important for us as Muslims to understand the life of the Prophet ﷺ so we can uh, understand the message that he والسلام, has come about. Today, we're going to begin with a general introduction, inshallah ta'ala, of the land that the Prophet ﷺ and the world that he has lived in. Sheikh Abdullah, welcome. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and give you jannah. This is actually a really wonderful endeavor that we're going to get on to, inshallah. The sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu uh, is something that every single Muslim person understands the importance of to the religion itself. But the source of the sunnah, the Prophet sallallahu uh, is the man who really is behind, uh, um, I guess really if, you, if you're going to believe in Islam, you need to know about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, is actually the kalima mm -hmm. or the basis of the kalima la ilaha illallah put into living form and that is so important today especially in the world that we are living in because people especially the younger generation generally take their knowledge from action oriented uh, right. individuals so it's not just going into an old library or you know, seeking knowledge, you know, from a, you know, a hermit on the top of a mountain. Mm. But now it's cyberspace, now it's information, now it's see it in, in, in motion and in action. So when we get the life of the Prophet Sallam, you will literally see the Qur'an, you know, in walking and talking, you know, as Aisha radiallahu anha described the Prophet Sallallahu mm. so, so So therefore, it is of critical importance uh, for people to go through the story, to live the experiences of the Prophet Sallallahu because these experiences are the base of revelation. So the Qur'an did not come down as a single book, but it is an answer to issues happening over this 23-year period. Mm. So when we understand the life of the Prophet Sallallahu we are understanding the context. And so the context is so important, and then it gives us uh, living solutions to the problems we're facing today. Yeah, and, that's a, and I guess really that's important when you're actually dealing with Islam itself and understanding it. But even before uh, becoming, uh, coming into Islam really in a sense, right? So a lot of people actually, are, are, let's say people who are trying to embrace Islam first. Yesterday we were talking about this, we talked about this completely two different, uh, I guess really extremes of not knowing the Prophet ﷺ. Um, if you don't know him as an actual Muslim, what is the danger of that? The danger is that your, your kalima, in a sense, which is la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, it, it's not complete because many religions, many individuals believe that there is a great spirit, mm. that there is a creator. Even the scientists talk about this power force that was there uh, of perfection from the beginning of time. Mm. Uh, but, the, but, the, but the completion of the kalima is that Allah Azza wa Jal then um, sent a messenger who was the seal of all the prophets and messengers who came, and through him came the last revelation. Uh, and, and so by getting that completion, then we're actually touching on the essence of what Islam is in its final form. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. In order for us to understand the, the, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, let's set the context, I guess really the general area of where the Prophet ﷺ himself is actually going. Tell me a little bit, Sheikh uh, Abdullah, about, um, I guess really the, the, the times uh, or before the Prophet ﷺ came, what was his society like? It's important um, for us to be able to release ourselves from present day names and constructs uh, when we are looking at history. Even if people look back at their maps uh, 30, 40 years ago, they would see the Soviet Union. 
um, which no longer exists on the map. Now it's Russia and it's broken up into many states. So therefore, historical maps, historical understanding gives the context. Now, we have to take a big leap back. We're talking about going back to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu We're talking about the 6th century. And for the time before him, we're actually talking about the early part of this uh, millennium, even B.C., mm. because this story goes into the, the time of B.C., the ancient times. Mm. Uh, and, and so it, it's important to, 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 to put it in its proper perspective. And by putting it in its proper perspective, then we understand um, the importance of the Arabian Peninsula mm. and how it fit right in with the last revelation. Mm -hmm. So this is important to keep in mind all the time, is that this is going to be the base of the last revelation to all of humanity. So this is Jazeera Tal Arab. This is the Arabian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And Jazeera is used in a sense that normally you think of Jazeera as an island. Yeah. Um, but this is really a peninsula. But when you look at it geographically, the northern part is covered by a sea of sand. So it was literally cut off from the rest of the world. And it is in this desolate place, this ancient uh, world, that the final revelation comes. And when you look at the 6th century, you will see that the great powers uh, of the world and one of the great philosophers of ancient Persia um, named Mani, this is somewhere around 4th century or so, but he said there's, there's four great powers in the world. Same way we have United States, we have Russia, mm. we have NATO, China. But there were four great powers at that time. One was the Roman Empire. The other was the per Persian Empire. The third uh, was three kingdoms in China. So he was looking at the whole world. Yeah. And the fourth, surprisingly enough, was in Africa. It was the Aksumite Empire. So that was considered to be one of the four great powers on earth. And then there was the Arabian Peninsula. But, when, but when you look at the, at the world, you will see the Arabian Peninsula is sort of like a crossroads. It's sort of like in between uh, these empires. Okay, so this is actually wonderful, Sheikh. Uh, describe to me, because I want to see uh, really in a sense, at that time, Sheikh, let's assume that we are now a part of, I guess, really the, the Roman Empire, right, in a sense. How did we see the Arabs? Like, what was, what was our perception of them? What did we think of them? The Arabs were generally seen as Bedouin-type people, even the word Arab itself, Arabi. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it does give the meaning of, like, a, a wasteland, somebody who's living in a desert. Mm -hmm. uh, and generally, the Arabian Peninsula was known, you know, for that. Except, of course, for the south. Now, in the south where Yemen uh, was, was, there were great civilizations. Although, of course, Yemen is still connected to the desert. Uh, but because of the frankincense and the myrrh and, and the spices coming out of the south, um, the Romans knew about civilizations. But they never gave it much weight because they are materialistic people. And in terms of materials, the Arabian Peninsula did not have the palaces it did not have the huge armies, the carpets, the porcelains, all of the different aspects of so-called civilization. Uh, but they were known to be uh, resolute people, uh, people with a very complex type of language, mm. and people who had this uh, resilience to be able to travel long distances and to survive uh, in very difficult circumstances. Okay, so that's that's wonderful. That's how they're seen, I guess. Really, uh, I mean, I asked you if the, the how the Roman Empire was seen. Is that how they were seen by all of them? Is that how they were seen also by the the Persian Empire, for instance? Is that how they were also seen by the um, the really the Aksumite uh, Empire? Like, is that is that like a uniform way of how they were seen? It was in a sense, although the Persians did not do much trade in terms of the frankincense and myrrh, the major trade routes. Mm -hmm. Persians had more of a connection with. Arabian Peninsula because of Iraq, the Tigris Euphrates. Yeah. Um, so, so their relationship was uh, slightly different than the Romans. However, still, the Arabian Peninsula, Jazeera Tal Arab, was considered to be a wasteland, mm. and it's a place where nobody really wants to pass through. You got to find a way around it, and not go through it. 
Okay, this, this is actually really important that you said this. How did the Arabs get there? I mean, you're saying that the land itself was such a difficult land, and, and most of the reasons why you're saying to me there wasn't a lot of communication with the other uh, empires, really, it was due to, due to the language and also the vast, um, I guess, really desert that they were living amongst, like how difficult the land itself. How did these Arabs come to live in this difficult uh, space? Again, if, if we look at the world in terms of the chronology uh, of, you know, the Earth, and the shifting of the earth. Uh, scientists tell us that there was a great valley called the Rift Valley. Mm. And that Rift Valley went, you know, from uh, uh, East Africa, uh, Kenya, and even below, all the way up right into Palestine. And, and, and that valley, it was that valley that split, um, that made the Red Sea. Mm. So in ancient times, and I'm talking thousands of years ago, Africa was connected to Arabia. There was no separation. And even if you look at the two uh, sides after the split, the Red Sea is not a major barrier. Mm, yeah. So therefore, um, the, the, the peoples of Africa, who uh, I think it's agreed upon, mm. human beings, Homo sapiens sapien, actually originally came from out of Africa. These are the original human beings who migrated to different parts of the world. And so in the same way that they migrated north, and went to the Sahara Desert um, of North uh, Africa. They went across the Mediterranean. They went to different areas. Uh, so they migrated into this Arabian Peninsula uh, area, mm -hmm. and they settled uh, in that area, keeping their connection uh, with the people across the Red Sea, especially the people in what is now known as uh, the Sudan, Djibouti, uh, Somalia, and, and those areas. Really, there was not much uh, separation. However, with time and through the changes in history, um, the Arabian Peninsula took on a special significance. Mm -hmm. But in the ancient times, uh, it was really just a place that people would cross through uh, in, in order to get somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's good. That's that's how how they came about. Uh, now, you oftentimes you talk about the types of Arabs. Um, I, I want to get into understanding the types of Arabs before we get into who Quraysh is and what type of people that they actually were themselves. You break down the Arabs into three different categories. Yeah, that's right. Uh, many of the historians and linguists uh, look at the ancient Arabs, and I'm talking thousands of years ago, as first being Al Arab Al Baida. Mm -hmm. And so this is what you could call the perishing Arabs. These are the ancient societies. And the Qur'an speaks about Ad and Tamud mm. and Madai and Saleh. Uh, there are still ruins there in the Arabian Peninsula of these ancient societies. But for the most part, although they were speaking a type of proto-Arabic, it was uh, a Semitic language, which some say is the original Semitic language, mm. um, they, for the most part, um, died out, and their languages died out because of mm. the droughts and because of destructions and things that happened. So they are perishing Arabs. The only thing left from them, I visited the country of Oman. And in Oman, there are some people who are speaking a language. Mm. It's not Arabic. Mm -hmm. And it's considered to it's not, be... It's not modern-day Arabic. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, a, it's, it's not even, you know, patois, colloquial yeah. Arabic. It is something else. Mm. And the Romani said, this is the remnants of this ancient language that was there, um, of, of Al-Arab al baida The second group you could call um, Al-Arab al mm. So these are the pure, original Arabs. And I think that most historians and linguists do agree on the fact that the, the original Arabs came out of the Yemen. Yeah. So it is from the Yemen um, that you find the pure form of the Arabic language. And then you will find the tribes that migrated to different places. Mm. Even if you look at places like uh, Medina, uh, Yathrib, the house in the Khazraj, and you go back and you'll see they originally came out of Yemen. Yeah. If you look back at many different parts of what is now the Arabian Peninsula, so it comes out of Al Arab and Araba. Mm. So this is the pure original Arabs. And the third group is. Uh, Al Arab al Mustaraba. Mm. And so these are the uh, uh, Arabicized mm. Arabs. So these are people who took on the culture uh, of the Arabs, but mainly the language. Mm. They took on the language and, and they came into the Arab world. And so today, if you look at the Arab world 
and you had a meeting of all the Arab states and you had a Moroccan delegate mm. uh, speaking to a Lebanese delegate. Very far off. They might not understand each other. Yeah. Only 10% of the, unless they spoke classical Arabic. Yeah. If they spoke classical Arabic, then they could, but it is because the, the, the Lebanese were originally Phoenicians. Mm. So they had their own language. The Moroccans and Algerians were originally Amazigh, they were Berber. So they had their own language. And then they took on Arab, Arabic and gave it sort of their own accent, their own nuance uh, and whatnot. So these are the three groups um, you could say that make up what we now know as the Arab world. The Arab world. Okay, very good. So the Arab, those are gone. Uh, like, what's an example of an Arab al Ariba right now, for instance, where like modern day kind of. Arab al Ariba, the best example I, from my own limited experience are the people of Yemen. Yeah. And you could also find, I found, because uh, I visited the south of Arabia, and if you go to um, Al Baha and you go way down south by the Yemen border, you'll find the Saudis down there. Yeah, the dialect that they speak, you know, is you know a pure type of Arabic. I mean, I was learning Arabic, mm -hmm. and so there's so many different barriers you have to go through with colloquial Arabic. Mm. And and one of my original teachers was from Yemen, mm. and um, he easily spoke Fusha. The only problem with Yemenis is they talk too fast. That's right. So you have to slow them yeah, down. Slow them right? their tongue, yeah. If you can slow them down then you will see that they are, it's, it's almost um, pure Arabic itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. And then the Arab al Mustarba, right now, I guess really with your Zoom, you've used the example modern day Lebanon, modern right. day Sudan, so modern day these, these other countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. wonderful. Sure. Jazakallah khair. So, this is actually a really good introduction to what we're going to get into right now. Because right now, I actually, what I want to talk about is this really is the Al Arab as, as an entity, uh, and this is a, I don't know if it's a unique thing to them, but it is something that they 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 sought out as, as something that's very prominent within their society, which is the tribal system, system of tribes, system of, and that's, I think it's really important for us to talk about this because the Prophet also, before we talk about him and which tribe he came out of, I want to understand a little bit about how the society operated in terms of tribes and sub tribes and so on. This is just in, in, in that area of the time of the Prophet. Again, when you look at the Arabian Peninsula, uh, we'll see that 90% of it or more uh, is Sahra, it's yeah. desert. And living in the desert um, requires uh, resilience, courage, strength, and it requires unity. So therefore, it was natural for human beings to come together in strong units. And so it is these units that adapted to different sections of the Arabian Peninsula and defended their land um, and built their traditions and their customs you know, around themselves. And generally, they were an oral culture. Yeah. So they would also transmit you know, their lineage um, and, and it became very important to them in terms of their lineage. And you'll see that you know, tribalism or the fact that you're in a certain tribe in some cases, uh, would save your life. Mm. If you look at Africa, for instance, West Africa, there are people who have scarification. Yeah, to, so know, you, to know where so, they're from. So you'll see. And you know, somebody told me, you know, this is not just a, a, a design for beauty on his face. That's his passport. Yeah. So literally, that's right. you know, that's a tribal passport. If somebody sees those scars on your face, you can go through. That's right. So if you don't have it, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. so, so similarly with the Arabs, they would identify themselves through the tribes as a means of survival, subsistence, um, as a means of unity, as a means of bargaining with other tribes uh, in order to form larger groups, which eventually uh, could come into nations. But it starts with that family, and then it goes to a higher you know, stage. Um, and I would say that really survival is the basis of it. It's not just a matter of pride. Um, it's not racism mm. because Arabs are light skin, brown skin, dark skin. It, it's yeah. not really a racial group, but it's more of a subsistence uh, uh, group uh, and and a way to unite uh, to survive this terrible climate. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. So I guess that's really the, the, the and it's also I guess really a part of protection for the community. So it's kind of like I guess really the law right now. Right now we have police and we have legal systems, that's right. but that's how you kind of have. Um, th this tribe, I guess, really, that's you've mentioned a couple of things that are positive about Asia, the tribalistic system, and so on. But we are going to talk about the Prophet. I do want to talk about some of the negatives 
of having such a tribalistic system? What were some of the things that you would have been apprehensive about, I guess, really living in that time? The problem with the tribal system is that um, because it is this protection system and it, and it has its own honor based upon its leadership, mm. um, they had a serious problem with intikam, revenge. Mm. And once blood was shed between two tribes, they could fight for the next 50 years, which would, that doesn't really make sense. But you know, in a tribal uh, honor system, it becomes very important. So that is the negative part. You know of, of of the tribal you know system and then if a larger enemy is attacking an area uh it would be easy to defeat them because they're You're broken into out. tribes they're not united yeah so therefore they could never form uh, a major entity a major nation like the persians or the romans or the axamite ethiopians mm. they couldn't do it because they were too divided into small uh, factions and groups so this really is a negative part. And then also in terms of intermarriage, uh, in terms of respect, um, in terms of linguistic differences, uh, sometimes people split hairs. They, they, they have these tiny differences, you know, which are not really differences, uh, but which keeps them divided for a long yeah, time. That's right. And I guess really, Sheikh, uh, um, I mean, we're talking about the, the tribalistic system so on, but I guess just really kind of, I guess really from my own knowledge, that wasn't something that was just specific to the Arabs, right? Like, I mean, other other groups also had tribes and sub-tribes. I guess it just really prevailed a lot it, within the actual Arabic, um, like, society. Like, didn't Persians have uh, tribes? Didn't Persians did they, had yeah. tribes. And Turks had tribes. The Africans. Surprisingly enough, Africans had tri tribalism, very serious issue in Africa. Yeah. Surprisingly enough, even in the Americas, mm -hmm. the indigenous people, the native people here had, had tribes. And yeah. one of the great uh, achievements of the Iroquois nation, uh, which is one of the most famous nations, is that they united the tribes in a confederacy. Mm -hmm. And so it was that confederacy that was the basis of the Constitution of the United States. Because Benjamin Franklin hard. went amongst the Iroquois and, and he found this system of uniting different tribes under this confederation, under this constitution. Uh, and so unless you have some uniting constitution or belief system, mm -hmm. uh, you will stay hopelessly divided. Wonderful. Sheikh Abdullah, this is actually really amazing that we're talking about this because I want to really lay down the ground for what it was going to be talking about next. The next thing that I want to talk about, I guess, really, is so we can is the city that the Prophet himself was born in, before the birth of the Prophet. I mean, I, let's not even before the birth of the Prophet. How did Mecca come about? I mean, it's 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 in such an awkward place in the world, right, in a sense. If you could just tell us a story of how Mecca as a, as a city came about. When you look at the Arabian Peninsula, uh, we see Yemen um, in the deep south. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, you know, north, which is by Syria. You, and then this desert area, and then you have the Red Sea, which you know, which is on the west. And, and so um, there were trade routes that were going from the south to the north, and from the north to the south. Mm. And Mecca, in a sense, what were they trading, sir? What so, they, so, so, so generally, you know, they would be trading the frankincense and the myrrh uh, from the south, because in Oman and Hadramaut uh, and these regions in the south in Yemen, yeah, uh, they had this. Um, you know, type of incense. Mm. It's almost like Canadians have maple syrup. Yeah. And so you cut it off the tree, it drips. Yeah. So they had a type of syrup as well, but when you cut it off and it forms a very tough uh, substance, if you burn it, it, it releases nice. a smell mm. that kills bad odors. Mm. And it's got sort of a spiritual mm. nature to it as well. There's another form uh, of luban that they have. There's another form that's a little bit gummy. Yeah. And so they would take it and they would cut a little piece off and then chew it. Mm. So that was your original chewing gum, your yeah. juicy fruits, yeah. Yeah. Uh, was actually first started down in the south. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is that you could travel thousands of miles with this substance in your bag and it's okay. Mm. It doesn't go bad. And so everybody wanted this. The Christians wanted it for their churches. The Buddhists, the Hindus, everybody wanted it for their spiritual centers to have this smell. The rich and the famous wanted to have uh, this smell uh, for their houses, to, to keep their houses, you know, having a good smell, and also their breath, 
uh, to have a good breath. So this is became part of high civilization. Mm. So the Arabs would then trade it from the south. It would go along the coast, the Red Sea coast, uh, and then to the north, uh, and then they would trade, um, you know, on you know the the coast in mainly in the area called Gaza, mm. you know, today. And we, we will go more into Sham, this uh, Sham you know, overall, yeah. later on. Yeah. Uh, but that's basically the area they would trade, you know, up and down the Romans and the Greeks. And the Phoenicians, they would meet them on the coast. Mm. And then there, they would have different metals and, you know, different uh, objects that were needed, you know, by the Arabs at the time, the leathers that were needed and uh, different, um, you know, gemstones and things that the Arabs could use at the time. So it was a brisk trade mm. um, that continued, you know, for hundreds of years. But Mecca is not on the, on the, um, I guess, really on the coast uh, close so how did it come about so so mecca is really more toward it's going toward the center yeah um uh, but it is sort of halfway in a sense when you're on your way up mm -hmm. and in order to understand what mecca was it's it's basically a desolate valley mm -hmm. and those who have been in deserts know they're not all nice evenly formed sand dunes mm -hmm. but in deserts there's flat areas there's valleys there's mountains there's all types of things that are in deserts. And in order to understand this desolate valley that was known as Becca, because mm. Becca was the original name, we have to go into the story of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, Prophet Abraham, mm. because it is there that this desolate valley actually took shape um, and became like a city itself. But in ancient times, uh, it was known as a valley uh, that is there, not too far from the coast, but in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's actually wonderful. Let's talk about how uh, Prophet Ibrahim uh, Ali for instance, uh, established Mecca. Um, tell me just a, a really brief and quick, because that's not really the, the actual scope of what we're talking about, but just give me a brief, quick uh, description of how this came about. Well, basically, we, t we need to look at Ibrahim Ali um in a different way, because people tend to be very nationalistic and, you know, extreme when they deal with religious characters. But if you look at the, the genealogy of Ibrahim, if you, he came from the Tigris-Euphrates region, mm -hmm. from, the, from the area of Mesopotamia. Mm. And so there uh, were idol-worshipping people, and he, he rejected the idols, he was driven out of his country, and he left from there with his wife Sarah, mm -hmm. uh, and they went uh, uh, into Syria, and then around into um, Palestine, and then down into Egypt. Yeah. Now, they were speaking a type of Syriac language that, that was connected to the Semitic languages. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually a total Semitic language, mm -hmm. um, but it was sort of a sister you know, language of the, of the Semitic languages. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh that uh, Ibrahim Ali Salam is not an Arab. He's not, by all the so, scholars, so he's, he's not considered an Arab. So he's yeah. not an Arab. Yeah. It's a very important point. Mm -hmm. And so he travels around, and um, in his travels, he, he ends up in Egypt on the Nile Valley. Mm. And the, the Nile had been taken over, according to some historians, by the Hyksos, the Amalekah, yeah. who actually came from Iraq as well. And it's a long story, but they eventually befriended him, and um, they had captured a number of Egyptians, because mm. the Egyptians are African people, by the mm. way, clearly. Mm -hmm. And um, they had captured you know, some of the nobility. And there are some accounts that say that he was given uh, a handmaid, uh, a, a princess mm. from a royal family, Haja uh, was her name. And then later on, uh, because Sarah could not have children, um, uh, Sarah gave Haja uh, to Ibrahim as a wife. Mm. So, so at that point, Ibrahim, Abraham had two wives. He had Sarah on one side and he had Hajar on the other side. Yeah. And he went back to the Philip Palestine area. Hajar actually got pregnant mm -hmm. and she conceived Ismail. Ishmael is known, you know, in the Western world. Yeah. And so uh, Sarah stayed in, in, in Palestine and Ibrahim, you know, with direction from the Creator, went south. And this is recorded even in the Psalms in what is left of the Bible. Yeah. Um, and Becca is the name that is being used. Becca is used also within in the Quran, the Quran yeah. itself. Uh, so Ibrahim and Hajar and Ismail went to the desolate. Uh, they went south. He was commanded by God. They ended up in the valley. And uh, Ibrahim, after a while, he had to leave uh, to go back to his other wife, 
who was in Palestine. This is all under divine direction. Yeah. And he leaves Hajar in the valley, and it's, it's very hot and, and very barren. Ismail is digging in the ground, uh, and water is coming, and so Zamzam water appears. Mm. Okay, so now, when, when Zamzam appears, gushing out, this now changes the desolate valley mm. into an object of attraction yeah. for the caravans. And so literally, from distances, you could see birds flying towards this area. And in the desert, that's a sign of water and life. That's and a sign of water. Yeah. And so the tribes, al Arab al Arab, who are coming from the south on the caravan routes, they realized their animals you know, are tending toward this area. Mm. Birds and their scouts went there, and they realized there's water in this valley. Mm -hmm. So they came to the valley, and they settled uh, in this area. And it is reported that Ismail, uh, uh, salam, he actually married from the Jurhum, uh, which is one of the Arab al Arab tribes uh, there. And so the settlements now started to form uh, with the pure Arabs coming from the south, and then the family of Ibrahim uh, salam. So Mecca now takes a different shape. Mm. It becomes a stop-off point on your way north or your way south. Yeah. And by the very nature of stop-off points, um, it becomes a center of trade. Yeah. Because people will drop their goods, they will pay for food, they will pay for water. Yeah. And so it started to, to grow. And people came from areas, other areas, to be in the area of Mecca. It's still in this valley, but it, it takes on, um, you know, a, a, a economic base. And later, with the building of the Kaaba itself by Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, and his son, um, it takes on religious, hmm. you know, sense in that the Kaaba or the house of worship was built there. So therefore, a, it, it changes from a desolate valley into now uh, a trade center, a religious center, uh, a, a center of the meeting of different peoples, mm. uh, and it becomes a very important city. Mm. Okay, so this is important, Sheikh, because by, by definition, really, the moment this, this city becomes a, a center of trade, a center of worship, and so on, the people there will start to speak a language that's a bit more accessible to everybody else. They'll learn the language of those who are actually arriving and so on, right? Um, I mean, I, I know I read some of the, the people where they say that, you know, the scholars talk about the fact that this is really the reason why the Prophet also, when he speaks to people, he can, he can speak to anybody who's anywhere because he has that kind of a skill and so on, right? Right. Uh, and, I, and I genuinely appreciate the fact that you, you're mentioning this here because it's really important. Okay, so now, Sheikh, um, a year or two, I mean, this, this is really modern time, okay? And I guess really what I want to talk about next time, uh, inshallah ta'ala, is the actual times, uh, the year or two before the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this we'll talk about the next time, inshallah ta'ala. Well, I, I think it's important, uh, again, in the formation of the people of Mecca. Yeah. And the nobles of Mecca. Mm. Because Ismail alayhi salam, he learned Arabic from the Jurham. Yeah. This is interesting. Yeah. He learned to speak Arabic. So he was not an Arab. Mustariba. He's Mustariba. So he yeah. learns to speak yeah. Arabic. Uh, and then his children now uh, become natural Arabic speaking people. Mm. But when you look at the genealogy, because I think it's always important to look at the root of the people, the uh, mother of uh, Ismail was an African mm -hmm. from a noble family in Africa, yeah. Egypt. Uh, the father was Iraqi. Mm. for Tigris Euphrates region. So this is, these are two major civilization bases. Meeting together. So it's a meeting together of the Tigris Euphrates, the Nile Valley, and the pure Arabs of the south. SubhanAllah. So the combination of these civilization bases forms the tribe of Quraysh. Mm. So the nobility is not a racial one mm. because there is no, if you do DNA, right? There's nothing special about them. You're going to see African DNA. You're going to see uh, uh, Mesopotamian DNA. You're going to see um, Arab DNA. It's a mixture, but it is really the position that they have. And then uh, being in that position, they, they develop a type of dialect as well, mm. their way of speaking Arabic because of the prominence of their city. Uh, and so they become, that is what they're now considered to be noble people. Mm. Okay, and so... That really is the base of the leadership uh, there in Mecca itself. 
uh, and, and the basis of the, that society. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, Shah. Jazakallah khair, inshallah. 